to know about the thesis essay, but we're afraid to ask. And hopefully you'll ask those questions tonight. And hopefully I can just give you an overview and clarify some of the um, things that we do here at Hingham High School, and I might add at Hingham Middle School, uh, to get the kids ready and um, on the, uh, where we want them to be in terms of their writing. My name is Helene Silva. I'm the K-12 Director of English Language Arts and Reading. And this is Mary Andrews. She's um, a teacher at, here at Hingham High School um, and a, um, a good friend of mine, a longtime colleague. Um, we're all kind of pinked up today because at Hingham High School today it was uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Day and the whole school was kind of very pinkish. It was really nice to look at and um, as, a, as a survivor of all that I was very gratified to see that and very uh, glad to be here to, uh, to, to witness it. So um, you're all set with these folks? Great. So um, this is kind of a, uh, a poster we have around the school probably looks very familiar to you, that old five paragraph essay, but it's something that we have posted in the library and in classrooms um, at the middle school as well, that just reminds students of kind of the superstructure that we talk about when we talk about essays. Um, our writing program in general um, is a very robust kind of writing program. We engage students in a variety of different writing experiences um, all across the different modes of writing. They get experience with expository, persuasive, and narrative and descriptive writing. Some writing that informs, writing that persuades, some creative writing, um, a lot of personal writing which is narrative in form, whether it's uh, to explain something or to recount a personal um, memoir or event. So they do get an enormous variety and scope of different writing experiences. But with that said, I will have to say that we've had a long-standing commitment to kind of drill down and focus on the kind of writing that we think will serve them well as they work through other classes in high school and as they work through their um, eventually in the college environment in their college courses it's worked for us very well in the past and um, we think that to focus and commit to doing you know one thing and doing it very well has just paid off enormously well for us um, and hopefully I'll be able to explain what that looks like to you tonight um, what we do in our classes in writing and in English in general is aligned with this common core framework. It's the Massachusetts framework for English language arts and literacy. It's based on, but not identical to the common core. Um, we've added a few things in Massachusetts uh, to the common core, mostly in the area of glossaries and in elementary reading. We have articulated pre-K standards uh, in Massachusetts that they don't have elsewhere in the Common Core. But our writing programs as well as our reading programs are aligned with the standards that are here. I know there's been a lot of talk in the news and uh, that you might have read about about the Common Core and some uh, feedback, but quite frankly, the common core standards for English language arts and literacy that have been adopted by Massachusetts are not all that different from the standards that existed prior to the common core. As a matter of fact, <laughs> probably I would say that a lot of them were based on the type of standards that we had in Massachusetts. The one thing I liked about them is that they're a little more clearly articulated now and a little easier to follow. As a result, we really didn't have to do very much to our program to quote unquote align with the Common Core. Um, one of the main, main differences is there's a little more focus in, in terms of writing on uh, persuasive writing um, experiences and we have made sure that our students in grades six through 12 
um, get those experiences in their class. And I think that's a very good thing for them to learn uh, rhetorical um, principles and how to um, fold them into their writing. Anything to add to that? Okay. So, as I said, we're, we're kind of on that, and we have been. We really didn't need the Common Core to uh, tell us that those things were important. They have been there. I've uh, been in the English department here in Hingham a little over 40 years, and we've been doing just this stuff for the whole time that I've been here anyway. So I can't really speak to uh, what went on before that. Uh, so, as I said, we're, we're kind of on that. And we have been, we really didn't need the Common Core to uh, tell us that those things were important. They have been there. I've uh, been in the English Department here in England for a little over 40 years, and we've been doing just this stuff for the whole time that I've been here anyway. So I can't really speak to it. Before that. One thing I'd like to show you, I'd like to start out with this, is um, the fact that kind of bragging rights we have is that when kids go off to college, I'm always impressed by the fact that a number of them take the time to write back to us and thank our teachers. They, I've actually excerpted these from emails and letters that students who graduated from Hingham High School have taken the time to write back to their teachers and say, wow, I'm in college and I'm, I'm doing really well. Thank you for what you've done to, to get me here, to make it so easy for me. So we I actually go back to a student. All the way back to 2004 when Doug Randall wrote to us from Tufts all the way down to, I kind of like Anna's comments, because she said, I think you can do a good job of preparing me for college writing. I'm currently taking a first year writing seminar, and we're learning about using thesis and analysis in our writing. Some of my classmates truly do not know what these concepts are. If they do know what they are, they do not use either concept in their writing. Being an ingrained both of these concepts in my mind, and I am able to think about writing paper with other thesis or analysis. And I like that because we see that this is becoming internalized uh, in our students. Since I've arrived at college, I've edited new newspapers for my friends, and I feel as though my background in writing from Hingham has given me the ability to help my friends in this process. I feel very comfortable writing structured research analytical papers as well as creative and personal essays. And she went to Case Western. We have all the way down to more recent ones. Um, Henry telling us his roommates have nominated him as the resident proofreader in his room. Um, and students from Georgetown and Clemson, again, just basically thanking us for what they see as very useful and purposeful um, and meaningful preparation in their writing. So uh, with that, I just want to explain how we get these students uh, through Hingham High School. And so what we consider and very proudly say is uh, ready for college. Uh, the first thing I'd like to look at is this pink sheet, color-coded them, on the basic structure. What we're going to look at tonight, even though I did mention that we um, give a variety of different writing assignments and a different writing purposes. Give me one second, please. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I guess we don't. I didn't pull that one up because we don't really need. We can look at this. Um, we are going to be looking at a structured thesis essay. This kind of essay which is the typical kind of essay that students write probably most often in their classes, whether it be an English class when they're uh, writing a response and analyzing a piece of literature they've written and writing a response to it, or in their history classes. This is the kind of quasi-expository persuasive writing where they're explaining and more often than not arguing a thesis. 
And the reason our students are required to write four essays per term, two of them must be an essay like this because, again, of our core belief that this is the kind of writing uh, that will serve them well as they take other courses in college in different subjects and as they navigate their way through high school um, subjects. So basically, this is the overall structure and some of the terminology that we use. You'll probably, if you dig through your students' notebooks and backpacks, find something very much like this that the teachers are using in their instruction and in their writing workshops. So basically, we're looking at a paper that, and this is probably no news to any of you, you probably remember this from high school and college as well, where an introductory paragraph that's gonna lay out your, uh, b basically lay out your thesis, what I'm gonna talk about, what I'm gonna argue. And the, we call that the main idea. So if they say, mom, I can't think of an MI, that's just the main idea, that's the point that um, students are gonna be arguing. One thing that we do, especially as we're teaching the fundamental parts of this kind of writing, is ask them to articulate what we call their DIs, or their developmental ideas. In other words, if you're gonna argue a point, how are you gonna do that? What direction are you gonna take your argument in? And I'll give you an example of this afterwards, but we feel that by stating that explicitly, especially at the fundamental level when we're learning this craft, it's important because it locks them in and it makes them actually form a promissory note about what they're going to talk about. As a result, once that's expressed, once I said, here's what I'm gonna talk about and here's the direction I'm gonna take it in, it's much less likely that they're gonna go off on tangents or irrelevant topics. It's much less likely that they'll start summarizing a piece of literature they're reading and they'll actually stick to the topic that, they're, um, that they've expressed or the topic that they've been given depending upon you know, what the assignment is. The next paragraphs, paragraphs two, three, and four, just follow along that way. If we've asked you to articulate, for the sake of argument, three directions that you're going to take this um, argument in, direction number one is that first paragraph or the first part of the essay, if it's, if it's longer. The second paragraph is gonna be the second part of that argument whether it be one paragraph or three paragraphs, depending upon the complexity of the uh, assignment and the age of the students. The third part or third paragraph will be the third direction that they've established for uh, that argument. And then the final part is the concluding paragraph where we're kind of just kind of wrap things up. Again, this is an overall structure which we hope that kids practice and practice and practice and practice. Kind of the good advice that you get from people everywhere from Big Bird to <laughs> Malcolm Gladwell in um, the, the Outliers, who <laughs> tells you that if you just keep practicing things long and hard enough, um, they oh, become... Wow. <laughs> I think I think I, I think we, they feel like I think when you think about their experiences from grade six through grade twelve, we might just hit that. Um, so, and, and we have a Hingham graduate here who can even attest to it, I think. <laughs> so, anyhow, any, you may have some questions about this, but I'm gonna give you an example of what that might look like, and then we can go from there. I've also included in this a glossary of terms just so you can have this, so again, when um, your child says, oh, my teacher says that my LOD is, is a little off, you can say, yeah, yeah. well, of course you need a good line of development. <laughs> Who wouldn't want a good line of development in his or her writing? Um, and this is our attempt to 
kind of standardize, if you will, I know sometimes that's not the greatest term, but standardize the language that we use so that each and every English teacher is using the same language when we talk about writing from grades 6 through 12. And even the social studies teachers, they're, when they're looking at a DBQ or looking at a primary source document and asking kids to write about it, they're talking about the main ideas and the developmental ideas and the logical line of development. So again, hopefully that the students see a central purpose and a meaningful purpose behind our instruction. Teenagers see that all the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of a quick listing of some of the terms that we do use and some of the, just to make our correcting to expedite our correcting a little bit, instead of writing line of development out each time, we write LOD, and the, and the kids pick up on this. Um, I think they pick up on this kind of stuff much easier than we do. If you've ever seen a LOL, one of the texts that they write, they're, they're <laughs> way into this stuff um, and don't have much problems, uh, don't have problems at all navigating um, the, the way we refer to things. Um, so if we say, ooh, a little weak on your AI, I think by seventh grade they know that that's their analysis and interpretation piece. The same thing with um, uh, weak MI. Ugh, my main idea needs you know, to be beefed up. So um, we have common language, common language across the curriculum. And one thing that I'm very pleased with more recently is a very strong feeder system. We've integrated and adopted some writing instructional materials at the K through 5 level, which I'm finally satisfied feed into the program that we have in grades 6 through 12 quite well. Because um, one thing I like about the Empowering Writers program that the students are using in grades K through 5 now is that the fact that it talks about different types of writing and the structures that are implied by those types of writing. So at the elementary level, when we're talking about an expository or an opinion, which will become a persuasive essay as they get older, we, we talk about having a topic and what we call the pillars that support it. So children as early as second grade are picturing what an expository essay looks like, knowing that Ooh, there's a big idea up there, and there's columns that support it. And again, I'm very, very pleased to um, have that kind of instruction at the elementary level, uh, because I think it sets a very good framework and a very good basis for what we're going to learn later and apply to more complex curriculum and more complex ideas. Um, what I'd ask you to look at right now is this sample essay, just to show you how we go about um, how we go about instructing this type of structure and these types of principles uh, as it relates to an essay. Now, I, I made this up years ago when I was doing a writing workshop with a ninth grade class. I was actually um, teaching them some structural principles because the, the material, the, the level of explanation was getting more difficult um, as we were looking for uh, ways to support not only our main idea but the developmental ideas that went along with them. As we go through the grades, um, we're looking to support that with textual evidence and then an analysis of that ev evidence. And that becomes a very complicated uh, task for students, especially when the literature is difficult. You're starting to talk about Shakespeare or um, Homer in the Odyssey. You know, th that piece gets thrown into the mix as well. So not only are we talking about writing, but we're talking about comprehension and analysis and synthesis of uh, information. So it becomes a very complex test. So I tried to simplify it for the students and we use this as um, kind of a peer writing workshop one day. 
I, I used Harry Potter was all the rage <laughs> at the time, so I used Harry Potter as an example. And what I'd like to show you is how I went about the instruction in that. Oops. What we did was we color-coded uh, the parts of the essay, the, the significant aspects or the structural pieces of the essay that I thought were important. So if you look at the introductory paragraph, Harry Potter, the young, dauntless, and very British magician, has captured his hearts and imagination of millions. Ever since the publication of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling, this young wizard has charmed readers with his bravery, his honesty, and his humility. However, Harry is not the only character with such admirable qualities. One of Harry's best friends and schoolmates, Hermione Granger, has the best leadership skills of any of the other characters in the novel. Now, the, the prompt might have been, you know, which of the characters in the novel we're reading has the best leadership? Now, rather than asking for a summary of the story, um, students have to answer that question and argue their point of view. So the thesis statement, the MI of this essay, is one of Harry's best friends and schoolmates, Hermione Granger, has the best leadership skills of any of the other characters in the novel. And that's what, as a teacher, as an instructor, I'm going to expect this paper to be about. So as soon as um, a student starts writing a summary, that's when we can say, no, that's not your main idea. You're off topic. Um, that's not what you're arguing. And furthermore, if you notice, that's what I'm going to argue. If it's Hermione that has the best leadership qualities. How am I going to do that? What categories am I going to establish so that I can argue that point? Her careful attention to her detail, her ability to make decisions. And let me see if I can just... I think if I take this down a little bit, in terms of and her willingness to sacrifice herself for others allow her to engage, emerge as the most qualified leader of the group. So do you see what I'm trying to point out is the relationship of that yellow main idea to the th three different developmental ideas. So I'm going to prove to you that Hermione has the best leadership skills of any of the other characters, because I'm going to argue about her attention to detail. I'm going to argue about her ability to make decisions. And then I'm going to argue about her willingness to sacrifice for others. So we have kind of a big plan here. And again, I think we help students by showing them that you don't need to deviate from this plan. The evidence that you're going to start pulling from the text is going to relate to that. So a summary of chapter two is irrelevant, doesn't fit. Um, again, I'm not doing a very good job of getting this up on the screen for you in a good way. So. At the end of this, without Hermione's ability to keep her friends in line, one may wonder if Harry would be the successful hero that he is, just winding that up. And I guess th the thing that I'd like to point out to you now is the next section of the essay. In a number of cases, Hermione's careful attention to detail establishes her as someone with leadership potential. Now, in order for, in what, the way we talk to essay, about essays with students is, that in order for the essay to have coherence, in order for it to be unified with their main idea, we should see a reference back to the main idea. Because again, you're arguing that main idea. Keep your eye on the prize. Don't lose sight of that main idea. And it needs to be integrated with that developmental idea. So for the first either for the first developmental paragraph or the first section, I'm going to be arguing the integration of those two ideas. How does Hermione's careful attention to detail make her such a good leader? 
So see what's happening? They're, they're really focused, and now they can start pulling evidence that relates to that idea. Not just random quotes, but details, examples, explanations, and quotations that support that particular idea. So it might read something like, in a number of cases, her careful attention to detail establishes Hermione as someone with leader potential. When Harry and Ron first meet her on the Hogwarts Express, one of the first things she does is fix Harry's glasses that have been broken for years. A good summary of something that relates to that main idea integrated with that developmental idea. While Harry's sloppy use of tape to repair these mangled spectacles indicates that he doesn't think much about the condition of his glasses, Hermione's immediate focus on the problem, which she quickly remedies with superior knowledge of charms, illustrates her ability to expertly assess and take charge of a situation. Notice the kind of references back to that main idea with you know, vocabulary that relates, <laughs> synonyms, to recall that main idea. Later in the story, during a charms class, Hermione helps Ron perfect his levitation technique by calling his attention to the correct pronunciation of the charm. She tells Ron, it's Wingardium Leviosa, not Wingardium Leviosa. Um, and again, we cite the page because it's a direct quote in proper MLA format. Although Ron is a bit put off by her bossiness, her instruction and careful pronunciation becomes the only hope Ron has for working the charm successfully. Finally, her careful observation during the Quidditch match enables Hermione to save both Harry and the game. When she notices Snape mouthing a spell, she sets fire to divert his attention, ultimately saving Harry from the danger of having his broom fly dangerously out of control and allowing him to successfully perform his role as seeker in a win for the House of Gryffindor. Clearly, Hermione is someone who, quote, sweats the small stuff, but it's this most careful attention to the fine details that enables her to effectively help and lead others. So as you can see, even though there is summary, there is explanation, there are details and examples and quotations, they're all carefully extracted from the text, synthesized, and you know, first of all selected, and then synthesized to support that argument. Now, this is a very simple example. Um, you can imagine what happens when, again, the <laughs> text in question becomes Macbeth and the symbols and or um, a poem by Emily Dickinson and the, the DIs become her images and metaphors and um, references uh, to things, different, you know, things like that um, when they become literary techniques. Again, depending upon the age and the developmental level of the students, uh, these main ideas will become more complex, as will the developmental ideas. 